Okay, so uh, I have taken it upon myself to introduce the first speaker. So the first speaker is probably the one person who doesn't need any introduction, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, it's Ilko Dolsa, uh, the guy who started it all. Um, I think it may have been around 10 years ago that you wrote your PhD thesis on yeah, this something topic, like, mm -hmm. on uh, purely functional software management. And I think it's the dream of pretty much every PhD student that 10 years after submitting the thesis, there's a big conference with lots of attendees <laughs> uh, who want to, are dying to talk about the, uh, the work. So without much further ado, uh, please welcome Ilko Dolster um, and his keynote address. All right, can you, uh, that sounds like it's working. I can hear myself, so yeah. Um, so let me first start with the uh, important thing. So welcome everybody and thank you all for coming. And uh, we missed a very important uh, thank you, uh, namely to the organizers. So uh, Rock, Paulus and Peter. So let's give them a big thanks for... for uh, taking care of uh, the organization and uh, so yeah this is uh, really uh, impressive uh, what you did here uh, we already had a uh, thank you for the sponsor so uh, especially since I work for one of these I won't ask for another applause uh, okay so in this talk I'm uh, going to do th two things so I'm going to uh, talk a, bit, a little bit about the state of the project and what we've been doing in the last uh, 12 months and uh, then I'm going to talk about the roadmap, uh, but I'm not good at the visionary stuff, so uh, I, I'll just talk about some things that I think are uh, uh, important in the future, and then I'll uh, open the floor uh, to you guys to uh, uh, share your ideas on what's important. So uh, uh, I would like to have a sort of interactive uh, thing. All right, so what has been going on? Well, uh, we actually have a very uh, nice, you could say, uh, almost exponential growth. Uh, so this is a graph of the uh, uh, the committers to the Next Packages repository. Uh, so as you can see, the first few years, there was not much happening. So I was writing my thesis, and basically Next was a vehicle for uh, writing papers, as these uh, things go. And then, uh, so after 2000, 10 or so, uh, things really uh, started uh, 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 to grow. Uh, so we're now at something like 160 uh, 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 individual committers uh, per month. So it's uh, quite a uh, large and growing uh, community. So uh, let's see if we can keep the exponential growth uh, going. Uh, Actually, it's, it's already tapering off a little bit at the end, so maybe you should ignore the last uh, bit. Um, so this is the uh, number of commits per day. Uh, so it's also uh, quite large. Uh, there was actually a peak last year, I guess that was around the 14-12 uh, uh, release uh, time frame. So I guess lots of people started uh, stressing out and doing commits. Um, so uh, yeah, also quite a nice growth. Uh, or perhaps uh, here's a graph, the, the, actually the title is, uh, is a misnomer, this isn't really the Nix packages size, it's the size of the Nix packages trunk job set on Hydra. So this, this is really how stressed uh, our build farm is. Uh, so the Hydra, the Nix packages job set currently consists of 45,000 jobs. So if you're wondering why Hydra is always having a disk full, uh, uh, this is why. Um, so uh, it has been having ups and downs. The downs are mostly every time our single Mac OS X build machine broke uh, and we disabled Darwin builds, you get a big drop. So, uh, uh, but this is this is not a very scientific number because uh, there's a lot of double counting and so on. Uh, but. Uh, uh, 
Um, so perhaps more interesting is uh, yeah, uh, growth in users rather than developers. So I don't really have any uh, measures of that because we don't have something like uh, what's called the Debian installation count. Or, and they have this thing where users can sort of register themselves. Uh, we don't have that, but uh, we have the, uh, the binary cache, which is, I guess, a uh, reasonable uh, uh, or is correlated to uh, 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 user growth. So this is uh, since 2013 when we had the binary cache. So every time a Nix user installs something, it, it comes from uh, cache.nixos.org. Uh, so uh, we're, we're now at some almost 100 uh, gigabytes of uh, traffic a day. Uh, so that has also been growing rather large, although uh, Rob claims that this is mostly him downloading stuff from, uh, from all his machines. Uh, or uh, the number of unique IPs per day, so we're now at something like 1,600 uh, per day, and I think we had a few hundred thousand unique IPs over the lifetime of the binary cache. So, uh, yeah, uh, I guess you could conclude from this that there are at least 1,600 uh, people a day uh, uh, hitting the cache, so doing uh, Nix or NixOS operations. So, um, all right, so that's some uh, numbers on our progress. Oh, uh, a few more. Oh, so we recently hit our 10,000 PR slash issue on GitHub, so, uh, and most of them are actually closed, so that's that's, I guess, a good sign. Uh, only about, a, oh, there are only a thousand open, so I uh, should uh, probably do something about that, but uh, I guess that's not too bad. Um, all right, so what, what has been happening in the, in the last 12 months? So, um, so we've had uh, two NixOS releases. Uh, I cannot possibly uh, summarize what was in them. Uh, thousands of new packages, services. Uh, uh, we have a whole new uh, Haskell framework. Uh, uh, big improvements to GNOME, KDE, and so on. Um, one thing that I really should give a shout out is Vladimir here. Uh, uh, this, this is so awesome. This is something we've wanted for years, and now we finally have it. <laughs> I had to mention this because these slides are, are made with LaTeX using a Nix expression. So this is the Nix expression that builds these slides. And it used to be that, uh, so I always stubbornly kept using TayTech because uh, it's a, a small, only 200 megabyte package or so, and not uh, Tech Live, which is this two or three gigabyte monstrosity, which you can't really use because if you want to build your slides, you would have to first download three gigabytes of crap, which is bad if you're in a hotel with a really bad internet connection. But now we have this really nice minimal uh, thing, so you only have to download uh, uh, the stuff that you need. So uh, I, I think this is really nice because it's, it's, it's an example of uh, how Nix can sort of uh, infiltrate other domains, because we now really have a better tech life than tech life. So, uh, all right, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to that. Uh, so what has been happening in Nix? We have had uh, free releases, uh, lots of new features, a few that stand out. Um, so uh, we have signed binary cache support, which is important for uh, security. So for instance, this allows us to uh, uh, serve uh, cache.nixos.org or mirror it. Uh, and uh, you don't have to trust the mirror. Uh, you only have to uh, have the appropriate public key uh, of cache.nixos.org. And this allows other people to set up caches. And uh, as long as you uh, uh, have the right public keys in your installation, uh, uh, it all works fine. Um, automatic downloading of Nix expressions. I'll, I'll come back to that. But this basically is, I, I think, going to make Nix channel obsolete. So here you can now just say uh, Nix env f and then the URL to a tarball containing Nix expressions uh, and install packages from there. And you can also put something like that in the Nix path environment variable. So for instance, I, I use this on NixOS machines in order not to have to uh, run Nix channel on those, those machines. You just set Nix, the Nix path environment to point 
uh, to a tarball, uh, like the 1509 current release, uh, and, uh, and, and then NixEnv just does the right thing. And a really big thing that has been happening is, uh, well, the Mac OS X support in general. So in Nix, we have had uh, sandbox support, but more importantly, in Nix packages, we've uh, had major improvements to uh, the packaging. In particular, we now have a, a, a pure uh, standard environment, or almost pure, so it, it doesn't depend on stuff outside of Nix packages, apart from uh, the C library, I guess, and, and a few other things. Um, so uh, I, I think you no longer need to have Xcode uh, installed to, uh, 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 to, 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 to bootstrap or to build things. Uh, so this is another great thing. So uh, there are a few, of course, still a few kinks, but uh, uh, once this works, I think really uh, Nix and Nix packages has the potential of uh, being better than homebrew for uh, a developer or some Mac OS X uh, who, who wants uh, uh, to, uh, to, to set up their environment. So uh, have another step to uh, world domination. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Hydra, so I've been doing some work myself on, on Hydra. Uh, so Hydra is really a big bottleneck to the project uh, because uh, well, Nix packages is really big, Nix OS is big. Um, so yeah, we had those 45 packages in the Nix packages job set, uh, and then multiplied by all the branches we have, like the staging branch and the various release branches, uh, feature branches. Um, so uh, uh, basically, uh, Hydra can't really keep up, uh, and it has also various software problems. Uh, so these are being addressed. So Part of it is already there, so we have a new Hydra queue runner that schedules builds much more efficiently. Uh, so it used to be the case that Hydra was really kind of stupid, so it had a queue of builds and then it would sort of randomly select some builds and basically run a Nix build on each of them. Uh, but that meant that if all these builds depended on the same derivation, like uh, rebuilding GCC, uh, that the whole build farm would be doing only one thing, namely rebuilding GCC. So you'd have all those machines except one uh, being idle. So that was really a bad utilization. And now we have a much smarter queue runner that just looks at the entire queue, at the entire dependency graph of all the builds in the queues, and if there's any build steps that can run, it will run them. So uh, that's a lot better. Um, Another thing is a Hyra provisioner, so we can now dynamically scale the build farm up and down. Um, so we can start EC2 spot instances to do builds. So for instance, if there are 10,000 Linux builds in the queue, then uh, it will fire up a dozen spot instances uh, to sort of quickly burn through the queue. Uh, now, uh, the only sad thing about this is that we can do this for uh, Darwin. Uh, because right now we have one Mac Mini doing all the uh, Darwin builds. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, we need to do something about that. And there are some more improvements on the way, but I think I have another slide about that later on. All right, and another thing that has been happening is that we have a, a NixOS Foundation now. Uh, which is a non-profit organization. Uh, I think the official description in the founding document was to support a purely functional deployment model, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, uh, so um, yeah, so this was really intended as a vehicle to be able to handle donations. So for years, people have been asking, well, Hydra is so slow, can I donate some money or some hardware? Uh, and we didn't really have a, a infrastructure to uh, to to deal with that. Uh, so now we have a, f a foundation and more importantly, we have a bank account and a PayPal account so, uh, um, and, and, and a legal identity. Uh, so yeah, so we can handle donations and we can uh, use that uh, in the future to, for instance, buy uh, Hetzner hardware and to pay uh, Amazon costs uh, and to pay for conferences. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's uh, that's very good. Uh, so maybe at some point in the future, the, the foundation could also do other things like uh, uh, 
handle copyright assignments, but I always get very bored thinking about that sort of thing. So, uh, all right. So that was the past. Now the the future, the roadmap. Um, so I should say that uh, roadmaps are fiction. Uh, so in my PhD thesis, there is actually a future work section, which is what academics do when they write a, a paper. There is the obligatory future work section, which describes all the things that you're actually not going to do, but uh, you want to show the reviewers how, how clever you are and that you thought about these things and you sort of claim them in case somebody else uh, decides to do them. Uh, but uh, number one on that list is uh, f for the future work is a fully Nixified system, uh, uh, a pure Nix-based Linux system, tentatively called NixOS. So uh, that one actually happened. So that's that's very good. Uh, I actually went through the others on the list, uh, and uh, this was really the only one that happened. Um, so uh, there's still some work to do. Actually, some of these things I've totally forgotten what they are. Feature selection, automatic instantiation, no ID. Um, oh, oh, this one was lies. A, a language for builders. So, so there was something in there about how Bash is a horrible programming language and we need something better. Uh, so uh, uh, Gweeks has that. Just, uh, just need to uh, give a shout out to them. Uh, the intentional model, I'll get back to that, but all the other stuff, uh, type system and so on, uh, um, don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, but who knows? Maybe maybe somebody wants to do a PhD on that. And uh. All right, so uh, here are just a few things that I, I think are uh, uh, interesting uh, for Nix. And, uh, uh, th th that I'm interested in working on. So this is by no means a definitive list. So this is why I'm interested in uh, uh, what you uh, all have to say. Um, so uh, a new command line interface, uh, distributed or peer-to-peer -peer binary caches, and a content address Nick store, which is a nicer name for the intentional model. Um, and uh, <laughs> so uh, this is 3.0, so uh, at, at the current rate our versions are going, this is probably in 2030 or so. so. But, uh, all right, so the, the, this, this is actually, this is something that I think sh we should be able to do in, uh, in, in the near future. Uh, so a, a new command line interface. Uh, so the current one is uh, pretty crafty with all these uh, separate commands and uh, a lot of them have names that don't make sense like nix instantiate, nobody understands what that means, so what does it instantiate and why should you care? Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's unclear why some things are commands and other are operations in commands, so for instance there's nix collect garbage but there's also nix store dash dash gc and they do sort of the same thing but not quite. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there are a lot of uh, suboptimal design choices like NixEnv uses package names, which is slow. Uh, so if you say NixEnv-i Firefox, it has to evaluate basically all of Nix packages uh, to figure out which one of those packages is Firefox. Uh, so this is why most people will say NixEnv-ia, capital letter, Firefox. So <laughs> then it will uh, only look at the Firefox attribute. So it will uh, uh, only evaluate the thing that is necessary. Um, another issue which is kind of in the interaction between Nix and Nix packages is that uh, Nix packages, uh, well, so a lot of packages have options uh, and there are also a bunch of global options, but they have absolutely no uh, discoverability, unlike say the NixOS module system where uh, and, um, options uh, are automatically uh, show up in the manual, so you, you can find out about them. But uh, all these uh, this Nix packages configurability is uh, uh, you have to know that you can pass a particular option or do an override or whatever. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so we have a system, a, a, a purely functional system with, have, with functions uh, that you can pass arguments, but uh, 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 yeah, if users don't know how you can pass an argument or that these arguments exist, it's not very uh, useful. So, uh, and NixEnv only does imperative package management, so uh, NixEnv actions are things like install, upgrade, uh, 
but uh, so this is in contrast to the NixOS style of upgrading where you have a declarative specification. I want a system with these packages taken from the most recent or uh, uh, version of Nix packages. And then when you do an upgrade, everything gets rebuilt. Um, so, uh, so clearly the Nix env style also has advantages. So for instance, uh, I don't want uh, all of open office to be re-downloaded everything uh, every time i uh, in, in install uh, some package um but uh, uh, yeah clearly there's also a value in having the declarative style so the solution is to replace it by a, um, a single git style command so a, a, a command called nix uh, with lots of subcommands like nix install, nix gc, nix shell, etc. Uh, so this would presumably be based on attribute names by default. So you could say nix install xorg dot x message or Python packages dot whatever, um, and uh, so it would be fast. Uh, and presumably it would also remember uh, those attribute names. And so then later when you do an upgrade, it will use the attribute name to do the upgrade. Uh, but the semantics here are not entirely clear yet. I mean, if, if you ever, if, for instance, if you installed uh, Firefox unstable, uh, it doesn't actually exist, but imagine we had something like that. It's unclear whether doing Nix upgrade should upgrade to the latest Firefox unstable or to the latest Firefox and what happens if Firefox unstable gets removed. Uh, so so there, there are some issues to figure out there. Um, another thing that lots of people have uh, demanded over the years is caching of searches. So nix-qa, nix-env-qa is uh, uh, pretty slow. Uh, if you're not on an SSD drive, this is also the re reason why I say maybe I've never really been in favor of implementing caching because uh, uh, yeah, what's the saying? Hey, there are two hard problems in computing, uh, uh, naming and cache coherence. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, making sure, especially given that you can pass uh, options to Nix packages that might influence the result of the evaluation uh, that makes the caching kind of tricky to do. Uh, so uh, really my advice would be for, to get an SSD drive, which is always good advice, but uh, especially for uh, uh, Nix. Um, so maybe also support a declarative style where you would have a Nix rebuild command that basically works analogously to Nixor's rebuild, uh, and maybe uh, deprecate uh, channels, or more precise, the Nix channel command, because um, we don't really need it anymore now that you have, you could say uh, Nix path is, Nix packages is, and then the URL of the channel you want to track. Because if you do this, Nix Env will automatically download the latest version of the channel. So you don't need to run Nix channel dash update anymore. Um, well, so there are lots of other things that can be fixed here. So uh, uh, I, I think there is an issue somewhere where people are uh, throwing around IDs for, uh, for this. Um, so uh, yeah, we just need to come up with, uh, with something nice. Um, yeah, so the Nix packages discoverability. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's a tricky problem. So we need some sort of new package formalism than what we, so something better than we, what we currently have. Well, so the style where a package is a function where we mix both the dependencies and the sort of the feature arguments like enable pulse audio. Um, so Nix Env has no idea to see that some of these things are options that you might want to show to the user and others are just dependencies that are generally not interesting to show. So maybe we need something, a function like make package that uh, separates the dependencies from uh, uh, the, the sort of the option, uh, sort of the user visible options, something like that. So I've, I, I don't really have an idea how to do that. Um, but uh, I think we do need something like that. Um, ah, yeah, so the distributed binary cache. 
uh, or the peer-to-peer -peer cache. So this would be uh, this is also something that uh, people uh, um, have wanted for a long time. So uh, maybe this would even uh, allow us to get rid of having a big Hydra uh, build farm. Huh? So basically, people could just build stuff, upload it somewhere, um, and maybe even uh, publish it via I IPFS. Uh, and then um, if enough people have built a certain package and it had the same build result, then you can trust it. Uh, so obviously this is risky. Huh? What do you do if there are sufficiently number of bad people who are uh, publishing Trojans? Uh, so uh, uh, th this is really something of a research issue, but uh, yeah, the the idea would be that uh, you would only download a binary uh, if from from a binary cache uh, if a specific binary has at least n signatures, something like that. Um, so this does require a, a greater build determinism than we have currently. So. Uh, Nix has always been about reproducibility of builds, but not about bitwise exact reproducibility. So, for instance, things like uh, timestamps uh, do end up in builds, um, and uh, that breaks this whole thing, because uh, if different people are building a package and they end up with slightly different binaries, uh, had then also put different signatures on that, so uh, you'll never reach the required number of signatures. Uh, so that's why we want exact reproducibility, which is uh, a hot topic at the moment. So for instance, uh, I think Debian got uh, uh, a few hundred thousand dollars from the Linux Foundation to work on uh, uh, improving uh, build determinism. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, things will come out of that that we can uh, use as well. Uh, so another thing uh, is uh, the content address Nick store, uh, also known as the intentional model. Uh, so that's really the only way, the only reason you need to care about is that it allows any user to install packages from any binary cache without having to be root. So right now, uh, had, with Nix, with the Nix daemon, uh, users can install packages uh, from source, uh, or they can install binaries as long as uh, that binary cache is trusted by, uh, by root. So you, you cannot just point at an arbitrary uh, binary cache and pull binaries from there. And the reason is that um, um, uh, Nix has to trust that a particular out output uh, corresponds to a particular derivation. So if I type Nix and Firefox, um, uh, it has to trust that a particular binary in the cache is actually the result of building Firefox and not the result of building Firefox and inserting a Trojan horse in there, so uh, or, or, or just replacing it with a script that uh, uh, formats your hard drive. So, um, so if you had a content address Nick store, then uh, basically you you, uh, you don't need that kind of trust anymore. Any user can do anything. So uh, that would be uh, uh, very nice. All right, so that was for Nix. So how about NixOS? Uh, well, a few things. So there are the standard things like a system D update, which has been uh, languishing for a while. But finally, we have a system D 2.2.7 uh, uh, about to hit uh, master. Uh, there are other things we should do, like GCC 5. Um, but the main thing that I think is very important is uh, Closure size reduction <coughs> is kind of a strategic goal, I think, uh, because right now NixOS is kind of fat. So, for instance, uh, the configuration, the, the system closure of, of my laptop is uh, something like three gigabytes. Now, I, I don't really care about that because uh, my laptop has plenty of disk space and it has generally a fast internet connection. But for things like containers and uh, cloud deployments, uh, you, you really want uh, the closure to be as small as possible. Because, for instance, if we use NixOps to deploy a gazillion uh, EC2 instances, um, uh, we have to upload or 
uh, at least part of the, uh, the system closure to each of those machines. So uh, the smaller the closure is, the better. Uh, now, the reason why uh, NixOS is, is rather big is that uh, unlike other distributions, uh, our packages uh, are generally not split into uh, uh, sub-packages like uh, well, uh, the binaries, uh, the, the headers, the static library, stuff like that. Uh, so Nix has a feature for that called uh, multiple outputs. <coughs> so there you can have a derivation uh, with multiple that produces multiple store paths, and then, for instance, you can put the documentation, which uh, nobody cares about because you just Google it, uh, into a separate output, <laughs> uh, and ha headers in a separate output, uh, so uh, so that they don't end up in the in the system closure. Uh, now, actually, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, so already, something like three years ago, I had. Uh, a basic prototype for that that have reduced closures a lot. So things like uh, what was it, the pen news reader re had closure reduction from 400 megabytes to 100 megabytes or so. Or so it was really a lot, um, but uh, it, it never made it into uh, into master. So uh, Vladimir has been working a lot on this. Uh, so hopefully. Uh, we can get some of this uh, soon. Um, should probably uh, stop doing these things in separate branches because that tends to uh, 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 diverge a lot, and, and especially. So it would probably be better to to, to do uh, these things in, in small steps uh, and and quickly merge them into master. Uh, but uh, this is always a hard problem how to how to handle these kinds of branches. Uh, yeah, so some Hydra improvements that we uh, really need. So uh, right now, uh, so yeah, like I said, we, we really have a, a bottleneck because we have a, a central Hydra machine which has something like three terabytes of disk space, <coughs> uh, which we're in, on the verge of definitively running out of. So this week we had some disk full and I couldn't figure out how to... Uh, 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 clear up some disk space. So I was deleting some old job sets, but uh, uh, and it's also really slow. So this machine, uh, so so everything that Hydra does, so um, every package that it builds, so it builds them on separate machines, but it all has to go through this central machine, so um, which has a really slow RAID something disk. Uh, uh, so very often the load on this machine goes to something like 100 because you have 100 processes blocked on doing I/O. So uh, so that's that's terrible. Uh, so the uh, so the next thing I want to do about the Hydra Q runner is to have builds directly uploaded to the binary cache, so they don't have to be stored on the local NIC store of this central machine. Um, so this would also be nice for users directly because uh, you don't have to wait until the contents of this machine gets mirrored into cache.nixos.org. So things would end up in cache.nixos.org directly. So as soon as Hi-Res builds something, your your builds get faster. Um, and uh, and of course we have uh, unlimited disk space on EC2. So. Um, and the other thing that we really need is more Mac OS X machines. And uh, since those are not so easily proficient, uh, that's, uh, uh, we'll have to figure something out. I mean, there is, uh, we use some company, at LogicBlocks we use some company in, in Atlanta, I think, that provides uh, Mac OS X cloud machines, sort of. Um, so we should plug some in. Uh, oh, that's actually my last slide. So uh, that was all I had to say. So uh, yeah, I would like to open the floor to uh, whatever crazy ideas or demands you have. So if you think uh, we should do this, we should not do this, uh, then please say so. So we have uh, 15 to 20 minutes for questions. So go wild. It's probably a very bad idea, but for build determinism, uh, 
why not have an external signature and an internal signature? What does that mean? Though, for instance, um, uh, you you change some some um, uh, yeah, you have some some file which has a timestamp. You know, it doesn't influence the external behavior of your program. Right, but how do you know it doesn't influence it? I mean, that's always so. For instance, take something like a timestamp. So, so generally, it doesn't influence it, uh, but. Uh, Nix doesn't know anything about. Uh, well, for instance, you might have a an output like a .a file, which has a, a, a timestamp or timestamps embedded in it. Uh, Nix doesn't know anything about .a files, so it doesn't know that those timestamps don't matter. All it sees is uh, a lot of bytes, uh, and it cannot distinguish between good differences and and bad differences. Except if it was supported and being declared as such. Have you ever thought about that? Oh, so you would declare in the derivation like these kinds of changes don't matter, something like that. Yeah, if you had some, but but, but it would have to be a pretty powerful way. I mean, so, 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 for instance, specifying that uh, timestamps in a dot .a don't matter. Uh, yeah, how, how would you specify that? Uh, what kind of formalism would you have something to declare that certain patterns in binaries don't matter? Or uh, so it would in in that in that kind of situation, it's better to just uh, fix the package so that it generates deterministic .a files. Right, if you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so <coughs> some of these things are easy, like the .a files. So it turns out that I think. Nowadays, there is an option to make them deterministic. I think we're even using that. Um, but then there are things like, uh, um, uh, for instance, the GCC profiled build. So it, uh, when you compile GCC, it does a profile run. And uh, so the result of that is very timing sensitive. So the GCC you get uh, depends, uh, might be influenced very slightly by uh, timings at build time. and. Yeah, there's there's no way you can specify that uh, this binary is equivalent to this binary. I guess. Yeah, that's just too hard. This is just a, a kind of idea or suggestion. We use uh, Nix a lot in production uh, right now, uh, mm -hmm. the company I'm at, which is the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence in Seattle. And... Uh, one thing we've run into in introducing Nix to new people, we've, we've got a lot of Nix expressions. We use them to manage data sets, all sorts of stuff. Um, but when new people come, the error messages a lot of times that we get from the parser um, or the expressions can be very cryptic. Um, I think as far as right. adoptability, that's one of the core issues we've run into. And like when we have new team members we're teaching it to is small little errors. You know, in you forget a semicolon somewhere or you don't, you know, close a string can result in just the absolutely, you know, very disconnected error messages. So that would just be one thing, I think, from an adoptability perspective, we need to improve is just error messages. You know, yeah. As, as simple as that is. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of a hard problem. So actually, what you mentioned, so syntax errors, in my experience, are not too bad because they're kind of localized. It will tell you there's a parse error at that point. The really hard problem is if, if you have, say, in, in an XOS configuration, you, you have some, some, well, type error, basically, and you get a giant stack trace, and you have no idea where this comes from and, and what causes it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and it, it's also not even clear uh, um, whether, for instance, a giant stack trace is actually helpful because it's just uh, all that garbage formatted over your screen generally uh, just scares people away. Um, Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, whenever you have a weird case like that, yeah, make a bug, yeah. Hi. Uh, two things. First, on you needing more macOS than builders, have you considered, or maybe this isn't possible, but just virtualization, like starting some Linux and starting macOS virtualized and building inside that you didn't need hardware then? Uh, I, I think, I, I think we, we've sort of thought about it, but it, 
yeah, there, there's always kind of the, the legal issue that you're not allowed to virtualize Mac OS X or... Uh, I didn't know that. Okay. So people, you, you can do it, but it's it's not really legal. I cannot confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> Right, 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 right. So, so then we. Okay. Uh, just second thing on on the previous slide, you said uh, you had a, the idea of caching uh, the names for uh, Nick's mm -hmm. search. Uh, what came up in my mind there is just that you really need a different representation of the data structures, like a reverse index, uh, to to do a faster search uh, to find these things. Caching didn't really make sense to me. There. I think the cache is just, well, it's just a cache, so uh, it, it, it stores uh, the list of packages, attributes, uh, uh, versions, descriptions, all the metadata uh, to make Nix env or Nix queries faster. So uh, if you then do Nix, Nix install, or actually uh, if you do Nix search, uh, Firefox or something like that, it would uh, be able to very quickly search the metadata. But, but of course, this whole caching stuff becomes a lot less important if we're installing by attribute name by default. Uh, so it, it, it might actually be that nobody cares anymore about caching once we do that. Hello, a quick practical question. Uh, you said um, we should define multiple outputs for the package to make the closure smaller. Um, if I, uh, for example, GNU TLS has uh, the, the default out and a man output defined, and when I look into the um, in Nix wrapper, I see uh, GNU TLS dot all dot standard env dot system dot type. Uh, dot man and dot out somewhere in between all those. So discoverability with that, can we improve that? Right, so there should also be a dot output. Okay. Uh, um, which is the list of outputs. So, so it's, it's one, it's in so, so, the, so the actual outputs, so if you define an attribute outputs is uh, uh, dev, man, uh, doc, whatever, uh, that causes outputs with those names to be added, so you get attributes with those names, but there's also the dot outputs attributes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but but there are still a lot of issues uh, to be figured out there. So for instance, uh, nix env, or nix, uh, so what output should it install by default? Yeah, and that's not really... out at the moment, right? I'm actually not sure oh, whether it's in the list. <laughs> yeah, I think it does the first. Yeah, so you don't get the man pages, which you probably do want. Uh, oh, it does oh. all. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So that. Right. Right. So for the camera, it installs all outputs. Um, and the general question, do you think it's still possible to put a type system over Nix expressions? What's, what's your take on that? Uh, that would be really hard. Because uh, it's not even clear what the, the types uh, would be. Uh, uh, so there actually once was a uh, Andres Loy wrote a uh, grant proposal for a research project, uh, and I don't remember the exact details. But uh, so I assume he uh, had some thoughts about what the type system would look like. But uh, uh, I, I assume that just doing basic uh, Hindley Milner or something like that would not work because yeah, it's basically attribute sets or uh, records. So. Uh, and, and there are type systems for 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 for, for record types, but uh, um, it, it's also uh, sort of slapping a type system onto a language that didn't have uh, a static type system. Uh, I mean, we do lots of sort of uh, dirty things that are probably not typable. Uh, so. Uh, 
Ja. <laughs> But it would be really nice. That's, uh... Uh, w one thing I'd be curious about is just uh, the relationship of Nix to containers and, and where what the future looks like for that. Uh, not that it necessarily needs to be formalized or not that we need to have one, but from a marketing to new users perspective, uh, where Nick sits into relation of that or features that or ways that we can improve that ecosystem. I'm just curious. You said containers, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I actually kind of skipped over that. Uh, so I had something there about improved container supports, but because my thoughts are not very concrete, I uh, uh, sort of skipped that. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think... Um, So certainly we can do a, a, a lot better at, um, uh, for instance, a, a, a using NixOS to build containers like uh, Docker uh, images, uh, uh, because yeah, and Nix or NixOS are very suited for that. It doesn't necessarily have to be NixOS, but uh, um, uh, since you have all that stuff anyway, you might as well like the module system. You may as well use it. Um, But I'm also been thinking about, uh, so for instance, System D uh, provides a lot of sort of container-like features. Uh, so uh, you can run a service uh, inside a, uh, a change route or inside an environment where it only has uh, access to a, a few um, bind mounts. Um, And, and, and that's actually quite convenient. So rather than having sort of full containers, you just define subsets of the file system. So for instance, the, you could say the Postgres service only needs access to uh, slash data slash Postgres and to, uh, well, only the subset of the Nix store, namely the closure of Postgres in the Nix store. So those are the only paths it needs. Uh, so that's basically a sort of container. And, and then you could have things like... Uh, using a tool like NixOps to migrate uh, had the, the contents of a container to a different machine. Because you know that the only things that Postgres can access are the things in those directories. So uh, then you really have sort of a handle on, on uh, yeah, what makes up a, a service slash container. Uh, so yeah, there are all sorts of really cool things that could be done there. Uh, that. That's, uh, I, I don't know how to do yet. Yeah, so I'm actually curious about the portability of Nix to other platforms besides Linux and uh, Mac OS X. So for me, for example, uh, I also do Windows development sometimes. For me, it would be great that uh, we can also use uh, Nix properly on SigWin. But the problem is, um, yeah, of course, we need manpower to maintain uh, the portability to, uh, of Nix uh, for SigWin. And also, we need to make some changes uh, to Nix packages. So, for example, that the standard environment works properly. Um, I think there are some improvements possible there. So, uh, for me, uh, touching the standard environment, I know how to bootstrap a Linux system. But still, I find it a bit scary. And I think, um, yeah, there are some uh, things we can do to improve that. Uh, do you also have some ideas on, on that? Or? Uh, not me specifically, but uh, Road Code, or is Rock, uh, where is he? Uh, ah, so do, do you have something about uh, how the SigWin or Windows stuff is going along? Yeah, so uh, it works if you sweat a lot uh, and look long enough. Uh, it kind of works a lot of impurity, but once you have this base image of um, Sigwin, at least from the last time, it's uh, when was the last time shot we taken uh, the branch? Uh, probably like in June, July. So from June, July, Nix packages they work, but then depends um, which package you want. Um, I don't know. Python works. Open LDAP works. Um, like quite a lot, but there are just like some, you just need to spend a bit of time. It's, it's not about manpower because nobody wants to work on Sigwin. Uh, it's more about, uh, no, it's, it's, it's true. Uh, but it's more about, uh, companies wanting it. That if, if they have the deployment and you want to deploy on Windows, it's possible. It just costs a bit more, um, which is the equals manpower. And of course, it will bit rot, uh, Quite a lot. I mean, it, it, it used to work at some point in the past, and 
then it for a long time it didn't and then you did stuff and so now it should be in a workable state again but of course uh, yeah unless we have a sick wind machine in a build farm it will probably uh, sort of oscillate between working and not working we have five more minutes for questions so Um, I've seen your email recently about Hydra that is not officially supported. Um, I would like to ask if it would be possible at least uh, document somewhere what commit works and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, how to achieve some working configuration. Right. Because it's one of the parts of the NixOS stuff that really brings people in, I think. And it's very hard to find a commit and configuration so that it actually works. So the most recent one should work. The, the, the problem is if you're upgrading, uh, because, I mean, it might break your existing installation because there are, there are schema changes and sometimes the default locations change and uh, or uh, yeah or it might require some other configuration changes so that that's really the problem but it, i mean the so the current revision is what hydra.nixos.org runs so uh in it, that should work um yeah so it's, but so the deeper question here is that we should really do Hydra stable releases, I guess. That's, uh, yeah, yeah. That that would be obviously uh, the best thing to do, but it's kind of a manpower issue. Uh, it, it takes time to do releases and write release notes, and uh, uh, yeah, so, and I don't really have that at the moment. So. <laughs> Yeah, my take on this is um, if you if you get someone to be like the release manager to spend some time helping, you know, go through the commits and and form a change log and all that, shouldn't be too much investment. And and if we get someone to take care of that, I'm sure that will get momentum and and you know more people interested. Um, so I I think it's yeah, just if somebody volunteers basically to do to manage releases, that will. Um, f push this forward. <laughs> Hello. A um, couple notes. Uh, when you're talking about upgrading the Nix CLI, sorry, ah. I'm over here. Um, uh, you might want to take an example from like the FreeBSD PKG. It's from almost doing what? the same thing. Like, so, uh, can you say that again? What? Oh, like the FreeBSD PKG, oh, PKGNG, okay. which is mm -hmm. you have a PKG search, PKG upgrade, PKG audit, PKG um, install. P yeah. It's almost like Nix search, Nix. Um, for with kind of the helping with SigWin stuff, I think you can run SigWin under Wine, so it, you could probably put that into a test for Hydra. Uh, speaking of Hydra, Hydra is incredibly useful, but it is kind of, it takes a bit getting used to. Uh, so if you have questions about this, the, I think the IRC channel is a good place to ask. Um, I, I have done the Hydra setup before and I try to help people, but I can understand the lack in manpower in creating uh, official releases for something that's kind of a development tool type thing. So, um, And one last thing, uh, for uh, containers, uh, some of the people I work with uh, released something called uh, Clear Linux containers that use uh, hardware um, support and uh, new support in the Linux kernels, and they can deploy uh, containers in about 150 milliseconds for uh, spawning off a new system. So there's some really neat technology going on in there that's <coughs> coming out of the open source technology group at Intel. Yeah, somebody was also talking about uni kernels. Uh, so. Okay, so we've run out of time. Thank you very much, Eko, for your for your talk. You.